Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Joe. I'm the, the new direct, well, newish director here at Vajrapani. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody. It's lovely to see some uh, programming and see some familiar faces and um, just say that, you know, we're going to be starting our new series of the Power of Mantra class here with Venbal Yonten, who um, just arrived a few days ago. And um, we look forward to having you here every Tuesday, Thursday, if you can make it. And then hopefully, um, as we had mentioned um, on newsletters and stuff like that, there will be accompanying retreats. So if you are in the area or you want to come to the Boulder Creek area of California outside of Santa Cruz, um, we will be having weekend retreats along um, with this program. So we hope to, to see you. With that I'll hand it off. Thank you so much. Um, we'll start by setting our motivation and then I'll get a little bit into the course itself. So just take a minute and uh, reconnect. Sange churon soge churon bai jan chu bhadu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi rola penche sange drupa sho sange churon soge churon bai jan chu bhadu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi Rola penche sange drupa sho sange churon sogi chunamba janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki rola penche sange drupa sho and allowing that motivation to reconnect to become real and personal So um, this Power of Mantra class, this is brand new uh, curriculum, brand new class, quite a new book. Um, this book by Lama Zopa Rinpoche just came out this year. And it's kind of the book that probably all of us really wanted when we were very first Buddhist. And now we've probably just looking around at the faces, a lot of us have been Buddhist for a very long time, or at least have had an interest for a very long time. And this is kind of like a back to basics, but not really basic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the book as a place to start the conversation, but I'm actually going to go into a lot more depth than the book offers, because it looks like there's quite a few older students here, and I think you can cope. And for those of you that are totally new, if you feel at all lost, please ask questions. This is the best forum. Um, it's going to be really relaxed. It's going to be twice a week. So that means there's plenty of spaciousness. So don't feel like you're taking up too much time by asking your questions. So whether you're new or old or anywhere in between, um, please make it really conversational and make it your own. So um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm just gonna go through some of the very basic points about Tantra, just so that we're all on top of it. And even in this very beginning stage, if you're feeling like um, actually there's some bits there you've always wanted to ask about, please do, okay? So here we go. This session, we're gonna look at uh, the content from the preface in chapter one. So if you do wanna buy this book, either PDF or hard copy or ebook, that's really recommended, but don't feel like you have to. Most of the main things will be share screened, but it's nice to support the process and all these are available through Wisdom. So we'll be looking at pages one to 25 related to this session. And just as a kind of grounding concept, reminding us that Buddhist Tantra, as opposed to other forms of Tantra, is for Mahayana practitioners to accelerate the path to enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So there are many types of Tantra. There's Hindu Tantra. There's any number of kind of Vedic traditions that connect with Tantric things. There's all sorts of New Agey Tantra, kind of divorced from context or drawing on a number of many things. Here, this is Mahayana Buddhism. So the point of Buddhist Tantra is to become enlightened. If you wanna practice Tantra for another reason, you're not allowed to practice Buddhist Tantra. And I guess this is the only part of Buddhism that really is for Buddhists. All other forms of Buddhism are very open to anybody to use what you like, put aside what you don't like, you know, pick and choose, cherry pick, never become Buddhist, 
lots of freedom and spaciousness about all forms of Buddhism, except Tantra. Tantra is for Buddhists, if you're going to be practicing it. So that's not to say you have to be Buddhist in order to kind of explore some of these introductory concepts, but if you really want to dig into Tantra refuge and Mahayana refuge particularly are prerequisites. Okay, so these practices rely on having an understanding of and a conviction in the three principal aspects of the path. So if you don't understand the three principal aspects of the path and also think they're great, also you can't practice Tantra, okay? So, um, you know, it's one of these things where I don't want it to feel like, you know, this is only an exclusive club for like super scholars or something. It's more that if you don't have these things, it's not gonna work. And then you'll be disappointed. And then you'll think Tantra doesn't work or there's something wrong with you. You'll get disillusioned and you'll give it up. Or, you know, you'll just kind of get into some angsty depression thinking, oh, I thought this was a wonderful thing, but now it's not working. What else is there? So without the three principal aspects of the path, Tantra is not going to have the effect that you want. What are the three principal aspects of the path? Shoot me one out of the blue, any order. Renunciation. Renunciation. What's Bodhichita. Uh, Bodhichita. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> emptiness yes. yay okay <laughs> well done team um I figured that you knew but it's just kind of sitting with before I kind of like just tell you sit within a for your moment in your mind reflectively what would happen without them okay so start with renunciation this determination to be free what would happen to your tantric practice if you didn't have renunciation just really sit with it. You don't have to say anything verbally, just really in your own mind, what's the danger of Tantra without renunciation? What's the opposite of renunciation? What's the point of renunciation with or without Tantra? Diminish obscurations? Diminish obscurations for sure, for sure. But when we're talking about this like intention to get out of negative habit patterns, this determination to be free from samsara, what do you really need to have solidly to really want to get out of samsara as opposed to just making samsara more bearable? Motivation. Yeah, motivation for sure. Uh, to renounce the attach attachment to uh, uh, like uh, worldly pleasure or worldly good and bad. I mean, not good and bad, but um, something that, like, I give an example. What what this will give to me? What it will be for the egoistic mind that we used to have. Yep, attachment right. being the key word, right? Attachment yeah. is the key word. And the thing is, is that easily to think att getting rid of attachment means getting rid of pleasure. That is completely a misunderstanding. I think we all know that we're students, we've been around. Getting rid of attachment doesn't mean getting rid of pleasure. It means changing your relationship to pleasure. And this fundamental change in your relationship to pleasure has to be something that you can do before you practice Tantra, because with Tantra, you're utilizing more and more tempting things, more and more aggravating things, more and more confusing things. You're changing your relationship to objects. You're changing your relationship to your own mind's habits. So you need just kind of like a workable level like in a perfect world, you'd have a realization of renunciation before practicing Tantra in a perfect world. That almost never happens. But you do need to think, in a general way, my samsaric mind gives too much power to the objects of the senses. It gives too much credit to the objects of the senses in saying these are what give me happiness or suffering. You need to have broken the spell a little bit of the lies your senses tell you. And so some of this is just like basic adult maturity, not even Buddhism, 
right? It's just like the basic thing of, uh, you know, when you want to go on a vacation because you're really stressed out and tired and you think, when I'm going to go on the vacation, then I'll be relaxed. Then I'll be happy. Then my mind will kind of return to its natural state. Then I'll recalibrate. But as an adult, you know, that's only half true that you'll also on the holiday have all sorts of expectations and disappointments and things will go wrong and things will be too much of this and not enough of that. And then after the vacation, you'll sort of need to recover from the vacation. Yeah, you're an adult, you've been on holiday, you know what happens. It was fun, it was rejuvenating, but never as much as your attachment mind told you. Or the recovery period is a lot longer than you thought it'd be or more expensive, et cetera, right? Have you ever seen a home improvement show? And at the beginning, they've got their wonderful plan and they think, okay, it's going to take a year and it's going to cost $100,000. And then it takes three years and costs a million dollars. And they're surprised every time, <laughs> every time it takes twice as long and costs three times as much, however, right? So as an adult, we know that the story is going to not be a fairy tale, but the attachment mind still kind of holds out hope that it might be. So renunciation is really taking the power back from the story. And if you can't do that at all, then you just work on your renunciation more before you tiptoe into Tantra. It doesn't mean there's any failing. It just means that needs to be the priority of your practice. So your relationship to the objects of the senses, not the pleasure, et cetera, that they can be the catalyst for. Does that make sense? If I understood well what just uh, we are uh, talking about, uh, we have to have the Mahayana uh, vows to begin the um, tantric, uh, like empowerment or anything. You do need a Mahayana vow, the Bodhisattva vow. But right now what we're doing is the kindness of Lama Zopa Rinpoche with this book is that everything in this book is pretty much okay for people without an empowerment. They're the introductory versions of these deities. To do the fully fledged version of these deity yoga practices, you will need an empowerment from a Lama. But during the empowerment itself, you'll get Bodhisattva vows. So even if you don't have them already, they'll do it yeah. right there in the ceremony. I had I had once online uh, uh, Zoom the, um, with Dalai Lama three, uh, two days uh, empowerment of that's why I have this um, Avalokiteshvara. Um, yeah, you have them already. No uh, worries. Done. Done. Yeah. Ah, problem solved. All right. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Yeah. No. Thank I'm you. His Holiness has been so kind during the pandemic, right? Just to do all of these things online and you have the vows. If during the ceremony you thought, I want them <laughs> or I agree. If you got lost and you weren't totally sure what was happening, that's okay. But if you thought, I want these vows or I agree with what he's saying, then they've been planted in your continuum and you can do this practice fully fledged. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, I, no I wanted to be sure. Yeah, good, good. Um, so then when you're thinking about bodhicitta, okay, so bodhicitta is the mind of enlightenment. Yeah, it's a main mind. It's uncontrived. We probably don't have it yet. We have aspirational bodhicitta that wants to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, but also wants a cup of tea, right? Like, it wavers, you know, it comes and goes, and we have to conjure it up, and we have to remember it, and it's not stable yet, but we love it, yeah, we love bodhicitta, and we want to have it more often, um, that is enough to kind of start, of course, again, in a perfect world, you'd have the realization, but you love bodhicitta, that's enough to start, what would happen, again, just thinking, not verbally, just in your mind, what would happen if you practice tantra without bodhicitta? What's the danger? If you think I'm doing this practice for myself, I'm not doing it in order to become enlightened. I'm not doing it in order to benefit sentient beings. I'm doing it because I want something interesting and fun to give myself life, entertainment, some sort of connection, or I want to play with my chakras or visualizations are pretty or et cetera, et cetera. But bodhicitta, meh, <laughs> you know, what's the danger in approaching these practices from that space? Okay, so is, does anyone feel comfortable to share? 
You're coming yeah. from the world of attachment. You're still yeah. in the world of attachment. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Other, other dangers practicing without bodhicitta. Arrogance. Arrogance. Yeah. Yeah, def- definitely. Yep. And all the stuff that goes with arrogance, like self-centeredness. And sadly, you do see this with some tantric practitioners that they get so hung up on their practice that they'll say things like, sorry, I can't do the gompa clean. I have to do my prayers. You know, like I am a special fancy practitioner. You dregs of society clean the path. Yeah. Like it becomes a little bit of like a haughty kind of arrogant uh, self-centered kind of weirdness can happen when you feel like I am now a tantric practitioner. I don't have to do these lowly things. Um, you see it happen, unfortunately, and it could happen to any of us. So it's kind of worth noting that tantra really isn't tantra unless you have three principal aspects of the path. And if you're ignoring the welfare of sentient beings right in front of you, how good could your bodhicitta really be? Yeah, the ones suffering right in your face. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. It seems like, you know, it, Tantra works with desire and desire is a slippery slope. <laughs> and I yeah. would think you're confused about any of these that could um, create some very um, heavy karma. Exactly. Part of the danger. Yeah, exactly. Because what do we normally do with desire is we've so objectified the substance or the person or the event that we have desire for that their relationship to us no longer really matters to us because they're just an object to fulfill the need of desire, right? It becomes so tainted. And, you know, just think of something simple like a dessert that you've really been wanting on a day that you're very hungry. And then you have a group of friends and there's the dessert, that kind of like, ooh, me first feeling that happens when the object of your desire comes into view. Before the dessert came, your friends were the objects of your attachment. Hopefully they were objects of love more often, but sometimes objects of attachment because that's how we are as humans. And you wanted positive feedback from your friends, connection from your friends. On a good day, you had love, compassion, attentiveness towards your friends. The dessert comes, all bets are off. To hell with your friends, me first. Right? So without bodhicitta, the more pleasure you're able to transform and utilize becomes more and more dangerous because that's how our minds work. As soon as we're a little tempted, as soon as we're objectifying something, we get very tunnel vision and we don't notice the impact we have on other people. So working with complicated energies, complicated dynamics makes it very easy for you to become self-centered. Yeah so easy to become self-centered. So our bodhicitta needs to be very strong. Otherwise we just kind of get lost in the exoticness of our new fun game. Yeah. And then without the wisdom realizing emptiness, what happens? Just sitting with that, okay? If you don't remember that everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises, what's your relationship to tantra gonna be? sort of thinking intuitively or from your past study? How will you treat tantric practice, yourself as a practitioner, the deity, the guru? What's the danger there if you're grasping at inherent existence? I would think really strong attachment because it would really be very, very difficult to overcome the strength of the attachment because of the our we're such you know in the desire realm yeah yeah just what caroline's saying yeah exactly she's saying it will become an object of desire exactly And, and i think also just think about what worries us about other religions We know there is wisdom in the great world religions, right? We have great respect for the traditions, particularly those that have ethics, loving kindness, compassion at their basis. We know that, you know, different strokes for different folks, but the religions that worry us, why do they worry us? What's a word that keeps coming up when you feel nervous around someone who is religious? Fundamentalism, perhaps, yeah? Dreamism. Yeah. 
And what makes you fundamentalist? Taking things a little too literally, um, thinking that your interpretations are essentially true, nothing else can be true. It's losing context, it's losing perspective, it's becoming a glassy-eyed fanatic. And that can happen to a Buddhist without remembering emptiness. Yeah, we can become just as fundamentalist as any other fringe religion very easily if we don't remember that everything dependently arises, including Tantra, including the deity, including our own enlightenment. The practices themselves, we can start to get too tight with. And it's not to say that the practices don't need to be followed as written, but it's more like don't reinvent the wheel. These processes work. You know, when you feel really comfortable with a recipe, yeah, like a, it's a food that you know how to make. The first time you made it, you needed the recipe, you needed someone to show you, you needed to know what it was supposed to taste like. There was a lot of support around the first time you made it. Then years go by and you can start to play with it and adjust ingredients and go off book and it's still delicious, right? Tantra becomes like that, where in the beginning you need the recipe and you need to follow it precisely. You need someone to hold your hand and show you how to cut the things. You know what it's supposed to taste like because someone else has shown you. But eventually you do go off book because it's not really about the recipe so much as the art and creativity and movement in the moment of what ingredients are you actually working with as an individual. Do you know what I mean? So if we have this spacious mind that understands emptiness and dependent arising, then we can use the mechanisms of Tantra without getting lost in thinking, if I recite this magic spell, I'm going to become a fancy levitating person. Or if I do it by the book exactly as written, but with an angry mind, it'll still work. You know, you can get weirdly tight about things when they're a little bit elevated or when they're a little bit out of your grasp, or if they're new, that's when we get tight. And that's where the danger of fundamentalism can come in. Because sometimes it's our very doubt about things or the newness of things makes us insecure. And then we grasp onto the couple of basics that we do know and think that they're always true in all contexts and we get tight and weird. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and kind of want to release that into there are many correct ways. Here is my correct way for this moment at this time. Yeah. So you need the three principal aspects of the path. You need, you know, Mahayana refuge, and you also need a connection with a valid guru. And guru devotion is something that in the sutra path is already kind of an extreme way of relating to another human being. And then when you get to the tantra path, it becomes even more complex in one sense, simple in another, but the danger again for fundamentalism is there. So when you're looking for a guru and it's a brand new relationship, what's the first thing you're looking for? Just intuitively, what are you looking for from someone that you're going to trust your path to and your connection to Tantra with? Kindness. Kindness would be key. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What else? <laughs> Good ethics. Ethics, 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 ethics for days. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Knowledge, knowledge of the Dharma and the ability to teach it in a way yeah. I can receive it. Yeah. And that's an important distinction because there might be a perfect Lama, but they're not perfect for you. Right. So if it's not resonating with your learning style, with your personality, with your way of relating to content, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them or anything wrong with you. It's just not a good fit. And it might be also that the karma is not there. And so, you know, don't force it if it's not coming naturally. But the big thing you're looking for is do I relate? Are they ethical? Are they kind? Those things. And definitely they know more than me. Definitely. But when you're looking for ethics, it's so tricky because you only see them in this one context where they're sitting on the teaching throne. They're at their best, they're on, right? They're in their professional mode. How do you know if that's how they're like all the time? What happens when they walk down the stairs and go back to their house? You don't know that about a lot of your teachers. What are they like in interaction one-on-one -on -one with students? What are they like in a community setting? You know, you, there's a lot of unknowns. And so you need to really, trust your gut and also investigate without feeling like you're being rude 
if there are weird rumors, follow it up. Don't assume they're true because certainly there are false rumors out there, but also where there's smoke, there's fire a lot of the time, right? And the reason you're doing this investigation is not to be critical and not to be divisive, but to know that if you trust your path to someone, then you find out things that disturb your mind, that disturbs your path, right? So it's far more efficient to do that checking before you take someone in that deep relationship than after you've already made that commitment, because then you need to work very strongly to see them in a certain light, and there can be cognitive dissonance if what they're doing is unethical. You know what I mean? Lots of charlatans out there right? Um, degenerate age, we do what we can. There's also tons of amazing teachers out there who were amazingly qualified, but you know, you have to always do your own vetting and make sure that you don't jump into an empowerment just because you're ready for Tantra doesn't mean you're ready for that Lama and connection. So sometimes you're like, oh, I've been hanging out for this empowerment for years. This random Lama I've never heard of and never met is giving it. I'll just do that. Should be fine. And like probably it has been a several times, you know, those of us that have been around the Dharma a long time probably stumbled into any number of empowerments and it worked out okay in the end, but sometimes it doesn't. And we don't want to bank on it being okay. We need to do our checking. Make sure you hear Lam Rim teachings from them, hear Bodhicitta teachings from them, have questions at least in class that you can engage with with them and just really see, can you trust them with your practice? Now, the thing is, is that that's so important for us in the beginning when we're getting used to relating to what's called guru yoga. But over time, the guru starts to be a subtler and subtler phenomena, less and less related to the flesh and blood human who gave you the empowerment. So in the beginning, that flesh and blood person was essential. In the beginning, you could not have done without them. But really what they were doing was waking up your own ability to hear and integrate wisdom. Yeah, they were waking up your own ability to hear and integrate wisdom, which is different than them like bestowing something upon you. It's like they were linking you to something. They're a gateway to something. So in the beginning, that relationship on your cushion relating to that flesh and blood person who gave you the empowerment is very important. But as time goes by, you become more and more integrated and merged with that essential wisdom communication. And it's less about the person. And then if they die, it's not the end of the world. Maybe it's a little bit like if you were brought up Christian, right? A lot of us were brought up Christian. When you're a little kid, you kind of relate to God as like this paternal figure, right? Who like is watching over you, maybe slightly like Santa Claus, like he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake, you know, there's a Santa Claus vibe with God, right? And uh, you talk to him maybe in your head and you hope that you're not being too naughty, but you think that he's probably loving and it's very personified and parental. And then you get a little bit older and you start having your conversations about religion and spirituality with your friends or your family or whatever. And you think, oh, maybe God is creation or something abstract. Maybe God is love, right? And you kind of change the way you relate to the divine just by virtue of getting older. Yeah, did some of you go through that? Like maybe in your Christian years or your Jewish years? Yeah, your relationship to what God meant evolved. Similarly, the guru. And so to allow that evolution and not kind of get stuck in, oh, my guru scratched his nose while he was talking to me. What does it mean? And you do like mental gymnastics about what does it mean? You know, and you're like, oh, maybe my nose primary consciousness is really easily attracted to smell and I really need to work on it. And he was subtly telling me that, you know, and you just make yourself insane. This can happen. Yeah. There's an argument for viewing things in that way if you have a happy, relaxed, spacious mind around it. But sometimes we can get really literal in a way that is actually counterproductive. So anyway, fun facts about the guru, but still we're um, talking in this class about ways to practice before you have a tantra guru. So don't worry, it's just a buyer beware kind of thing. Yeah, go ahead. a good question and, and there's a couple different schools of thought um 
But I think that in our tradition, pretty much all Tantra empowerments are the same. The guru is Buddha, at least within the context of your sadhana practice. Yep, in this very elevated way. Some traditions view it in a more gradual way, but in our tradition, it's um, once you're in, you're in, the guru is Buddha, the guru is the deity, and that is, you know, from Kriya Tantra all the way up. Lama Zoparimshe speaks about sutra in a quite a Tantra way. Yeah, you might have noticed, yeah? So he might be talking about Lam Rim, but the way he speaks is if the guru is Buddha even from that point. And some of that is because Tibetan Buddhism is so thoroughly integrated with Tantra, it's sometimes hard to separate what is Sutra and what is Tantra from Tibetan Buddhism. But it's good to know that with your Sutra teachers, it's okay to see them as a mouthpiece for the Buddha or a representative, and particularly in the teaching context. And the rest of the time, they're an ordinary person, whatever, relate to them with the respect you would show any ordinary person or a college professor or something. But you don't have to be quite so full on about it as with Tantra. Yeah. And, you know, in the Zen tradition, I started out in the Zen tradition when I was a kid. They had a very nice way of looking at the world, which is see everyone as your teacher, right? Just see everyone as your teacher. Never mind empowerments, never mind Tantra. Just live in the world as if everyone was teaching you something. And it's a nice way to live, right? It's very empowering. But it's very easy for us to get into that kind of funny, passive way of viewing practice where we feel like the great beyond is sending us messages and trying to tell us something and giving us, I don't know, a journey to follow in some sort of destiny, fate, weirdness way. When it's really like anything can be a teaching if you decide to make it so. Who decides to make it so? You right? And so whether the divine is sending you lessons, or life is sending you lessons, or karma is sending you lessons, kind of winds up being irrelevant, because it's up to you whether or not you decide it's a lesson. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's a more empowered way of thinking about the world, to be making those choices proactively. How can I see happiness, suffering, boredom, everything through a transformative lens that's going to lead me towards enlightenment? because I can't really know where all the content came from. Karma is more hidden than emptiness. Yeah. Any, any questions so far? Did I lose anybody? Can we have um, Dalai Lama like our Lama and then yeah. um, saying to ourselves like every, everybody who is with him is I can learn something from them but my lama is Dalai Lama is it possible even if we didn't have like did um, he didn't accept us like personally well his holiness is sort of a separate case right because he's so pervasive yeah like he'll give the Kala Chakra empowerment to thousands of people at once he does things online like he's an expansive, powerful being, sort of a special case. So you don't have to have like gone up to him and be like, your holiness, yeah. please. Can you yeah. be my He's like, yes. <laughs> yes. yes, everybody. Yes, if you want, uh -huh. I am, you know. Um, so it's fine to think of his holiness as your primary teacher or your root guru and to have a number of other teachers that you see more in a mentorship role or more in a college professor role or, you know, nurses, not doctors, or whatever, however you want to see it is fine. But if you've taken them, if ta you've taken empowerment from them, you do need to elevate. Oh, yeah, I, I see. What is... right, right, right. But you can have many root gurus, mm -hmm. right? But, and you can say that the one I relate to the most is like his holiness. Mm -hmm. But if you empowerment, you do need to elevate your way of viewing them accordingly. Yes. Okay, I understand. Thank you. So we need to have understanding of and conviction in. Yes, both. So <laughs> renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara, bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, and the correct view, the wisdom realizing emptiness. So without having understanding of and conviction in the three principal aspects of the path, tantra doesn't work or becomes dangerous or both. So 
without renunciation, Tantra potentially comes a further cause for samsara, right? The very thing that's supposed to help us get out of samsara actually reinforces it. Without bodhicitta, tantri, tantra potentially reinforces self-cherishing. The very thing bodhicitta is trying to overcome, if you misuse tantra and don't have bodhicitta with it, you can reinforce self-cherishing. And without the correct view, tantra potentially reinforces self-grasping. So the self-grasping ignorance that's the root of samsara, right? The reifying view of the perishing aggregates or viewing the self in your own mental continuum, holding it to exist inherently, that ignorance is undermined by tantra, but only if you do it right. Yeah, otherwise tantra just becomes another problematic way of seeing the world. So what you're wanting to do is constantly in these sadhanas, sadhanas are the tantric practice manuals, you're forever, quote, dissolving things into emptiness. And then things are arising from emptiness. And then they're dissolving into emptiness. And then they're arising from emptiness again and again when you read these practice manuals, right? And part of that is to remember that the deity, yourself, the practice, the guru are all empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. But that space of emptiness is like infinite possibility. And so you kind of think that spacious womb-like possibilityness then takes the form of this for this purpose, this for this purpose, this for this purpose. But you're not getting locked in and fixated on it as that's the only thing that can do that or from its own side it does that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so what you're trying to do is to really remember each time that you can hold awareness of emptiness while still experiencing the bliss of attachment, and then that destroys attachment, but not the bliss. So the classic quote that we use from um, one of our famous Tantra texts um, is something like the great secrets ambrosial nectar or something fancy like that, is that it's like a termite born from, from wood eats the wood. Yeah, so you need wood, right, to make a little termite. The termite is born out of the wood. And then what does the termite eat? He eats wood. So it's kind of like you're generating attachment, seeing that it's empty, and then destroying your attachment. That's part of the philosophy of Tantra. So wisdom and method come together from the very beginning. They're not separate projects like they are in the sutra tradition. All the time together. And having them all the time together keeps you from falling into nihilism or eternalism. And if you bring bodhicitta and renunciation to them, then you don't get lost in the fantasy that you've created for yourself. Then you get, don't get lost in kind of self-absorption about your own practice. Does that make sense? So things arising from emptiness and dissolving into emptiness again and again in these practices, then you start to ask yourself, what is the deity? What is the Buddha? What are these things anyway? And it becomes a really interesting discussion because in Tibetan Buddhism, if you talk about something like Tara, for example, Buddha Tara, there's the historical figure, there's the folk story, there's the multiple emanations, and then there's the archetypal energy. Who is Tara? Does it matter? <laughs> what are we relating to? It, it becomes a multi-layered thing. So if you're talking to a small child, you might talk about the folk story of Tara or the historical figure who was, quote, the first Tara. If you're talking to a teenager who's ambivalent about religion, you might talk about the archetypal energy of protection and action that is kind of intrinsic to feminine energy. If you're talking to an adult, you might say, it's all of these things combined, latent in you, manifest in those who have practiced. And a practitioner can manifest as Tara. Any Buddha can manifest as Tara when that energy is needed. He will take this shape, this form with this mantra, but that's not the point. It's just the method of it. You know, so we're kind of like, flexible to play with these things without getting too literal, but not so flexible that we sort of mix all sorts of disparate points and like make our own Tantra because that would be inefficient. So, you know, you're using these forms, but not getting lost in these forms. 
the forms being the sadhanas, the practice manuals. So in this book, the ones we're going to cover, we've got Shakyamuni Buddha, and we've got Chenreze Gavlokiteshvara, Manjushri Jamyang, Tara Droma, and Medicine Buddha, I should have put the Tibetan, uh, Sangye Menla, and Vajrasattva, and the 35 Buddhas of Confession. So these are your classics in Tibetan Buddhism, and in the book, there are practices related to them that you can do without empowerment, and they're really beautiful and worth doing. Um, if you already have these empowerments, there is an elevated version of all of these you can find on the FPMT shop. So, deity. This is an emanation of the enlightened mind used as the object of meditation and tantric practices. So you'll sometimes hear deities referred to as yidams. The reason I mention it is that sometimes if you're really used to Lam Rim and you see deity, you're going to think about the worldly deities of the god and demigod realms, and that's not what we're talking about. And then deity yoga is the tantric practice of generating oneself in the form of a meditational deity within a purified surrounding. So the purified surrounding is the environment of the deity or the mandala of the deity. And probably all of us have seen sand mandalas like this. And they are flat representations of something that's actually three-dimensional. So this is Chen Rezig's, and theoretically you wouldn't see the mandala until you have the empowerment, but this particular one is so widely seen as a blessing for the mind, it's a little bit more out there, this Chen Rezig mandala. And basically what you have is this inner world that you're creating as an outer world. Uh, it, they're always mansions with four doors, four entrances, and a Vajra fence somewhere around them. And the idea is that this protection around your inner house protects you and protects others from afflictions. So your afflictions don't leak out and hurt other people. Their afflictions don't come in and hurt you. So that Vajra fence is part of almost all mandalas. And then the four sides are four different colors and the center is a fifth color. And these are always related to the five Buddha families, which are the five main archetypal energies that we talk about in Tantra. So all Tantra is going to have these four complete purities. The purity of environment is the mandala. The purity of the body is the body or deity of the Buddha. Purity of resources are the offerings made and received within the sadhana. And the purity of activities is sending and gathering light rays. And all of this is engaging in a path with similar features to the result of Buddhahood, especially the form body, it has great significance and power. It's indispensable. So in order to achieve the resultant state, the union of the two enlightened bodies, it's essential to engage in a path characterized by the union of method and wisdom. This fact is accepted by all Mahayana schools. So you see the mandala, you remember it's empty. You see the body of the deity, you remember it's empty. You give offerings, you receive offerings, you remember that they're empty. And you send out activities like purifying environments, blessing sentient beings, making offerings to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and then gathering that in the form of life back to yourself, remembering that it's empty. So these components are in every single practice manual, but they're not necessarily signposted. It's not necessarily a nice big heading that says, now you're creating the cause for a pure environment. Now you're creating the cause for a pure body. It doesn't necessarily say that, but it's woven in to all practice manuals. And this is the big thing in Tantra where you hear this expression, taking the result as the path. And taking the result as the path is something that a very stable mind can do. But if you don't have a very stable mind, you can start to get a little bit weird in your thinking. Yeah, you can think I'm already enlightened, the environment's already perfect, everything's already fine. And then someone in your house falls down the stairs and you're like, no, it's fine. It's the manifestation of the Buddhas and the sound of them thumping down the stairs is the sound of mantra and everything's fine, right? That would be a mistake. But you could go too far with this thinking of taking the result as the path and get funny about it. 
So you're staying grounded in the fact that in the relative world, there is suffering. Ultimately, agent, action, objects are all empty of inherent existence. And what suffering is to one person is not necessarily what it is to another. And how things are framed are spacious and can be creatively looked at, et cetera, et cetera. You can really play with what is reality. But ethics are essential. And the basis of ethics is understanding relative truth. Relative truth is deceptive, but it's what we're looking at. The deception comes from us our lack of understanding reality. And yet it's all we've ever known. So you have to make these educated guesses like if someone falls down the stairs, go and look after them. Yeah, and then when things are calm and when things are on your cushion, you're really thinking about the world that could be and the world that already is on one level. The fundamental purity that is there because things are empty. So playing with these things, you have to be very grounded and creative both. Because too much of one or the other, you kind of miss the point of Tantra. So you're ripening the seeds for your Buddhahood through rehearsing them. Yeah, you're rehearsing your own enlightenment. And that's the very thing that creates the cause for you to be enlightened. Yeah, no, what that is, is kind of set up for the four purities, which is also helping to create the purity of the environment. So it's related to the purity of the environment. But what Tujay is talking about is self-generation through the six deities related to Kriya Tantra, lowest Tantra. And you see this, these steps most frequently in the Chenrezig Sadhana or the Nungne Sadhana. So you start with a brief meditation on emptiness, right? Myself, the deity, and all phenomena are of an essence, one taste in emptiness. Meditate on that, 30 seconds, five minutes, five hours, whatever, empty. Then from emptiness comes the sound of the mantra resounding in space. That's what you're talking about, yeah? So from emptiness comes sound, yeah? And then from sound comes letters. From letters and sound merge, then they land on your mind as the mandala and all these steps arise and you eventually wind up being the deity with the mandala. So these are the stages of self-generation in Kriya Tantra and it's creating the cause for the purified environment to have things like purified sound. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very beautiful part in the Chenrezig Sadhana if you ever wanna have a look at it. Those of you with the empowerment, it's a really beautiful part. So, um... I've done some tantric empowerments and I made a commitment to do them every day. And so, and I, I do, but it's, it's hard. <laughs> so, I mean, and, you know, and like in six session, you know, they say you create it like this really bad things happen. If you don't do that or something, you know, like, and I'm kind of manic about it, you know, and I'm, I'm just like looking at my mind and I'm going, well, what's a healthy way to, um, you know, like if my kids are here, you know, I'll stay up till two in the morning because we went out and I didn't have time, you know, and I'm like, is it okay if I miss it? Or like, I'm kind of scared and I don't know, what's a healthy attitude? I'm a lay person, I, you know, I mean, I live alone, so I have that privilege of doing with my time what I want. But I think my attitude, I need to understand what is a healthy attitude. Yeah, I mean, because that's sort of like Zeus is going to send down thunderbolts sort of vibe. It's not what we want right. to bring in tantra practice. Right. And yet, so incredibly precious, we don't want to take it for granted or treat it lightly. And that balance is really hard to strike, right? Yeah, but in my mind. Yeah. What you want to do is to rather tell yourself, rather than tell yourself how you're bad and what you shouldn't do, that is counterproductive. Let's not do that. Think about what's the benefit so that you feel lifted and inspired. So what are things you already know about the power of promises? And the power of promises is so much about how things have more depth over time. Like if you exercise once, you're kind of tired that day, maybe a little sparky the next day, and then you never exercise again. What was it all for? 
right? But if you do a little bit of exercise regularly over time, you get stronger, yes? So what you're wanting to do is to really think about continuity, yeah? The power of promises over time builds depth. And if you want depth, you need continuity. If you want your promises to have more power, you have to keep them. And we're human and life happens and you sometimes lose the will or the momentum or the inspiration or there's a tragedy or a celebration and you get distracted. And part of the thing about Buddhism is that all vows are there with the thought that you'll probably break them. Right? It, the, the point is that if you could keep them perfectly, you wouldn't need them. You would already be a Buddha, which is why there are things like self-empowerment. So what you want to do with your tantric commitments is as soon as possible after taking the empowerment is to do the full approach retreat with the mantra accumulation related to that deity all on one seat together with the fire puja, because that qualifies you to do self-empowerment, what is sometimes called self-entry which purifies all your tantric samayas as if you were with the Lama once again, taking the empowerment again. And then you don't feel that like grief of, I broke a promise. You had that, whoops, I slipped and I'm back in the saddle, moving on. Yeah, so you really want to think about the, the commitments that you have, getting those retreats done, because then when life happens, you can just do a self-empowerment, get back in the saddle. You need the fire puja as well to have it be complete. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's very helpful. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And, you know, when you do mantra accumulations, they all need to be done on one seat um, yeah. and, you know, not break the continuity and all that kind of stuff. But it's not as intimidating as it sounds. Lots of people get their accumulations done by doing the pre-dawn session and the evening session and then having a normal life in the middle of the day. And they might take months and months to finish their accumulations. But by doing the pre-dawn and the evening session, they're kind of holding the essence of retreat. And then maybe they can join some group retreat later down the track for the fire puja. You just need to keep doing the long sadhana until you actually do the fire puja in that case. But there's ways to do these things at home, right? And so rely on your local Dharma center, your local Sangha to help set you up. If you can't come to the Dharma center to do those retreats, maybe someone can help you do it yourself. Yeah. And there's creative ways to do fire pujas, um, you know, based on your location and based on fire season. And, you know, I've done a lot of fire pujas in parking lots and campsites. <laughs> oh. and, you know, so you can be creative about it, but it's certainly worth doing. Yeah. Oh, very helpful. Thank you. Well, the important thing is to not think I've broken my continuity. I'm bad. And oh, well, now I'll just let it go. And the price I pay for bro breaking my promise is just to feel bad about myself. And so if I feel bad about myself, that kind of makes up for me having broken the promise and guilt and shame and Catholic upbringing all just kind of come together in a beautiful dance of sadness. Don't do that. Yeah. Think, oh, whoops, I meant to kept that. Life happened. What do I need to do to repair it and prioritize that without guilt, without shame, without heaviness? I mean, the spiritual path needs so much humor and humility because we make all these plans based on how we are at our best. And then when we have a bad day, we're so disappointed, but you've always had bad days your whole life. You will for many, many lifetimes to come. Plan for how will you be on a bad day, not how will you be on a good day? But our ego says that good day version, that's the real me, right? It's like, no, that's the occasional you, but don't get excited. With Kriya Tantra, there very rarely is a commitment, right? Or sometimes the commitment is just to do the mantra a few times a day, right? So the need for the full approach retreat and fire puja to do self-entry is more just because it's a powerful thing to be able to do a self-entry practice and it purifies your bodhisattva vows. So no doubt we're breaking our bodhisattva vows all the time. Um, some of us haven't even read the bodhisattva vows, but we have them because <laughs> we took them during our Kriya Tantra empowerment, like Avalokiteshvara. So um, 
if you do a Kriya Tantra approach retreat and you do the self-empowerment, you can purify your Bodhisattva vows. And that is a wonderful thing to do. It's not the only way to purify Bodhisattva vows. There's lots of other ways you can do it. But these full approach retreats, the benefit is more than just being able to do self-entry. It's an amazing purification tool for so many levels of things. But there's less pressure, I guess, to do so if you're just a Kriya Tantra practitioner, because your commitments are not this daily thing that you've, you know, maybe stuffed up on a day or two or something. Poetry is basically taking the empowerment by yourself. And you can only do the empowerment by yourself if you've done this approach retreat, right? So the mantra accumulations are gonna be specific to the deity. So like Chen Rezig is six syllables. So you need to do 600,000 mantras to do an approach retreat of Chen Rezig. It takes about three weeks, four sessions a day, three weeks. It's doable, I promise, it's totally doable. <laughs> do what makes sense to you. If you want to wait on an approach retreat until you're practicing highest yoga tantra, totally fine. Yeah, totally fine. It's just, it's important to realize that these numerical retreats where you have 100,000 or 600,000 or however many gazillion mantras you do on one seat, the, the point isn't just like, I guess, to get the job done and never think of it again, or just for the self-entry that the practice itself is hugely transformative to do in such an intensive way. And so what happens is that once you've done like a three or four week Chen Rezig retreat, then you go back to doing your little Chen Rezig practice, maybe once a day, or maybe just the mantras, it has more oomph, right? You have more connection. And the point of Kriya Tantra is to have health and long life so that you can practice highest yoga Tantra and become enlightened in one lifetime, right? So the more you intentionally give energy to your little Kriya Tantra practices, the more oomph you're going to have for your life, the more power. And Kriya Tantra is so powerful because there's so many techniques for developing calm abiding and special insight simultaneously. There's so many practices to clear life obstacles, like, you know, never underestimate the power of Kriya Tantra on its own. Even if you only ever did Kriya Tantra, you would go so far and doing it in a retreat context is incredibly powerful. And then you do your daily practice. It has a lot more depth. In the interim, you know, how we say the three jewels of refuge, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are like the doctor, the medicine, and the nurses. You know how in a regular hospital, the nurses wind up doing most of the work? You do need the doctor for the prescription and the accuracy and the depth of knowledge. But in terms of your daily practice and your retreat practice, workshopping stuff with your Sangha can be hugely beneficial for just like getting tidied up and getting organized and figuring out what to do. Yeah, and just kind of like what resources exist. You have to be a little proactive and, and you have to ask for the help that you want and keep asking and sort of find a home center or a couple home centers, even if they're just online and use them. You know, it's, it can't be a passive thing. It's only the really huge Dharma centers that have continuous programs where you just kind of plug in and wind up learning all the things. Most places you have to say, I would like more teachings on Chen Rezig, you know, and then see if they'll put it on the program because sometimes they're looking for requests. Just the logistics of how long your commitment will be are usually things that if you really go after the older students, they'll tell you. If you take highest yoga tantra, you will definitely have six session guru yoga, which definitely takes 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night. And if they don't have a preparing for an empowerment class before an empowerment, ask for one. Yeah, because a lot of us do just kind of fall into it and we're like, what's happening? What am I supposed to do now? Uh, definitely, it's a, it's a thing. So we need to be more organized in the West for sure. Yeah, for sure. But part of it is... There's also a strange psychology, which you might not agree with, but it's what the psychology is of it, which is if you don't know all of the commitments and promises, you're more likely to be open to saying, 
yes, I will do it. Whereas if you know all the specifics, you might generate doubt and you won't plant the seed of the empowerment on your continuum because you'll waver and wonder, can I really do this? And remember that commitments are so different in Eastern traditions than they are in Western traditions, because even if you mess up, you can always repair it. So what you wanna do is to say, I make this promise happily, freely in a committed way. And now I'm gonna find out what I committed to. It's not how we are trained, right? And it's not how we grew up and it's really uncomfortable, but there is a, a way of thinking where you can see the benefit of it. Cause you just kind of go in with a pure heart and say, look, these people I look up to and want to be like are doing this. All right, let's see. Yeah, but in terms of time commitment, you can usually find out kind of basic stuff if you really ask. I just wish it was more kind of upfront for sure, like you do, but um, you can usually find out if you ask. And I know that without commentary, these sadhanas, I wouldn't say torture, but they are a hard work, right? And you're not alone in thinking that. You're really not alone in thinking that. And it's important that people say that, that, okay, you're excited, you're inspired, you do an empowerment, then you get your commitment, you look at the practice manual and you go, oh, refuge in bodhicitta, yay. Four measurables, yay. Then wait, what? What's happening? What does that mean? How do I say that mantra? Who is this? And you know, you're like, now I'm gonna do this every day forever and I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't wanna, <laughs> right? And that is really normal and you know, Find a commentary, go to a class, but there is power in just keeping the continuity of getting used to the structure, the framework, the words, clarifying where your stuck spots are and kind of being really self-directed in your study and, and saying to yourself, okay, on page two, I always have this doubt. Or on page five, I get stuck and I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. And you start making a list of where your resistance is, where your confusion is, and then you ask and you make an appointment with your senior sangha or you make an appointment with one of the teachers and they are actually more accessible than they seem. You can, you know, make an appointment. And then you're one of the organized students who actually says, here are things I want to talk about. They'll be so excited. Trust me. <laughs> I think that we expect to kind of be given a curriculum or like kind of be walked through a process in a way that seems really linear and logical. But what winds up happening is we're just kind of out there on our own with these new promises that we've made without a lot of structure or context. And then it's secret. So then it's hard to find commentaries and it can be really disillusioning. The only thing I can say is be proactive about your questions. Um, Cause if we're passive and waiting, a lot of stuff's not gonna happen. And then what happens is you gradually lose connection to the practice, gradually stop doing it, but then feel like something's sort of lost and you feel kind of sad. And, you know, there's just this kind of like uncomfortable feeling of I promised something, but I didn't know what it was. And now I'm not doing it. And I am either justifying it and excusing it to myself in all sorts of ways, or I'm just feeling sad and guilty about it. Or, you know, there's all this complicated emotion then. And it, it's a shame. It's a shame. So we need to look after each other as, as tantric practitioners and share resources and talk through things and, you know, and tell our um, people who are giving us empowerments what some of our angst is, because I think they forget sometimes that we don't have the same amount of like blind faith as someone who was brought up Buddhist, you know, so we need to say what our angst is and, you know, then they will adjust. Hopefully. You know, I find that, um, it's, it's helpful if I can approach this as like, um, okay, I'm just going to use this as, an, as a way to open my mind to the existence of other cultures on the planet, you know, like to let go of my, I, my Western idea of how things should happen. Like that's the way it should happen, yeah. you know, and because it's happening differently. Well, what's wrong with them? <laughs> you know, like, and it's hard to do though, because, you know, but it really helps me open my mind. And that feels so good when I can do it, which is not all the time for sure. Yeah. Look, and, and what I, what I guess I want to leave you with before we have a, a, just a quick, like three minute stretch, and then we'll do practice. Um, is just trust yourself, but trust the right part of yourself. Okay. 
because we all have kind of two different versions of our inner narrative. We have the wisdom narrative, which is the grounded one, the kind one, the patient one, the spacious one, the one that is a good friend to others when they're in distress. We all have that already and it's growing all the time. And then we have the afflicted side of ourselves that says, I can't, it's too hard, this is stupid, I don't get it, you know, I'm too hot. That's what I'm saying today too hot, you know, like whatever. Like we have that side of ourselves, which will indulge in letting things go that we actually feel are very precious, but they are hard, you know? And so trust yourself, but trust the right side of yourself, the less afflicted side, and just make your choices kind of unapologetically without defensiveness, without kind of the inner cringe of, is this the right way or not? You know, really trust that deep wisdom that says, here's the pacing I can cope with. Here's the depth I can cope with. And here's actually what my goal is. Okay, so let's have a three minute stretch and then we'll do a little practice. Okay, so we're going to do the Shakyamuni Buddha practice, which I'm guessing we've all done at some point or seen or heard about, and it's probably not anybody's daily practice, but kind of one that comes up if you do like a Kopan course or a Lam Rim retreat or one of those. Um, there's a kind of nice short way of doing it, which is just the purification visualization and then the merit and blessings visualization, just using like Namo Gurube, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. It's really nice to do. Um, but this Shakyamuni Buddha one, really just think of it in terms of reconnecting to your refuge, refuge in this context, taking the shape and form of Shakyamuni Buddha and um, just kind of see how you go. And uh, it's in the book. So if you want to talk about it next time on Thursday, we can totally talk about it then. But right now we'll just go ahead and do it. So nice straight back. However you're sitting, straight back. And we'll do a couple preliminary prayers just to get us warmed up. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merit of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merit of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merit of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Very brief Tonglen meditation. On the in-breath, compassion. On the out-breath, loving kindness. Imbuing both with joy and equanimity. In breath, compassion. May all sentient beings be free of suffering. Out breath, loving kindness. May they all have happiness. Each cycle, shrinking the self cherishing thought. Seven limb prayer. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. 
please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. And so take a moment and visualize Shakyamuni Buddha in the space in front, seated on a lion throne, lotus, sun and moon. One hand in the earth touching mudra, the other in his lap holding an alms bowl full of nectar, wearing the saffron robes of a monk, a cloth hovering above his skin, not touching. He's seated in the Vajra posture and is looking directly at you, simultaneously holding in his gaze all sentient beings. Three-dimensional golden light, radiating light in all directions. And whether the image is clear and detailed or general, simple light, the most important thing is to feel the Buddha is here, present with you, free from fear, skilled in freeing others from fear, unbiased compassion, helps all impartially, whether they help or harm, Perfect equanimity, perfect compassion, wisdom, and ability. One in nature with all of your teachers. and expand the visualization of the Buddha to include all sentient beings surrounding you. Imagine doing this practice on their behalf, together with them. And think, I've received this perfect human rebirth and have met both the infallible teachings and the infallible teachers who can lead me on the path to enlightenment releasing me from all suffering and allowing me to attain ultimate happiness. This is not so with all these other kind mother sentient beings who have been my mother countless times and have been so kind to me. In order to help free them from their terrible suffering, I will do this meditation and attain the state of Buddhahood myself. and request from your heart, please purify me and all sentient beings from the delusions, obscurations, sicknesses and afflictions caused by external harmful spirits. And of course, all related to negative karma. And in response, the Buddha sends a stream of rays of white nectar coming from Guru Shakyamuni Buddha's heart, flowing into you 
entering through the crown of your head. Stabilizing the visualization, radiant white purifying light. Holding that awareness, think to the guru, founder, Bhagawan, Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Please grant me your blessings. To the guru, founder, Bhagawan, Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Please grant me your blessings. To the Guru, Founder, Bhagawan, Tathagata Arhat, Perfectly Completed Buddha, Glorious Conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Please grant me your blessings. I, I, of white nectar slowly fill your body completely purifying all your delusions feel that they are pouring strongly into you like when you stand under a strong shower as soon as the rays touch and flow into your body a sensation of infinite mental and physical bliss fills you Feel your body is completely full of radiant white light. And think all my delusions and sickness, as well as all the afflictions caused by the external spirits are completely purified. And then shift the visualization and visualize a stream of rays of golden nectar coming from Guru Shakyamuni Buddha's heart, flowing into you, entering through the crown of your head. This light is the essence of the Buddha's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. As your body fills with this light, feel infinitely blissful mentally and physically. Hold this while saying the mantra, this time under your breath, Tayata Om Mune Mune Maha Mune Soha Tayata Om Mune.
Ayata Om Mori Mori Ma Mori Soma. Feel you're completely filled with the Buddha's radiant golden light, and you've attained the qualities of the Buddha's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. Then the snow lions dissolve into the throne. The throne dissolves into the lotus. Lotus dissolves into the sun and moon. They dissolve into Guru Shakyamuni Buddha, who comes to the crown of your head, melts into light, and dissolves into your body. Feel that all the wrong conceptions are completely destroyed and everything becomes completely empty. Your mind becomes the blissful, omniscient mind of the Buddha and feel that you are the Buddha. Light beams radiate from your holy body. At the tip of each light beam is a tiny Shakyamuni Buddha. All these Shakyamuni Buddhas enter and absorb into each and every sentient being. Purify all their suffering and its causes, delusion and negative karma. Then the light beams with Shakyamuni Buddhas at their tips return and enter into you and rejoice by thinking how wonderful it is that I've attained all, I've enlightened all sentient beings. And then finish by making the dedication by the merits of having done this meditation practice, may I attain the enlightened state of Guru Shakyamuni Buddha and lead all other sentient beings to that enlightened state. <laughs> Janchu sencho rimbo she ma ke pa nam ke gyu chi ke pa nyam pa me pa yi go ne gondu pelwa sho. May all of our teachers show the aspect of long and healthy life. May we practice exactly according to the Mahayana advice they give. Remembering the emptiness of the agent, the action, the object all lack inherent existence because they dependently arise. Okay. Thanks everyone. Um, if you feel like reading the preface in chapter one before Thursday, that'd be great, but no pressure. Uh, see you Thursday. Thank you, Venerable Yontan. Thanks everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.